Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking History. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're all keeping well. My name's Liz and on this channel I do exactly as it's called. I talk all about history. And we are here, we have made it. We are at the end of the Anglo-Saxon, well nearly at the end of the Anglo-Saxon period. And I am spoiling you. You're not only going to get one video, you're going to get two. This is a two-parter. So make sure you like and, like and subscribe so you don't miss the second video. But we have reached it to Howard Godwinson. Now, I could be mean. I could just go, well, Howard was born in such and such time. He had an older brother who kidnapped a nun and then he was exiled. But then he got exiled again. Oh, and then he got exiled again. But I'm not going to give you any details. His younger brother got the boot out of Northamptonshire. But I'm not going to give you any details. And then the whole family were exiled. But I'm not going to give you any details. Instead of that, let's go all the way forward to 1066, Battle of Hastings. Oop, I got shot in the eye with an arrow and I did Would I do that to you? No, of course I wouldn't. So... I thought in order to understand Howard Godwinson, we've got to understand the Godwin family. And I love this family. <laughs> I love this family. If none of you don't come out with a snimsy little bit of respect on this family after, let me know why. You can tell me why. <laughs> anyway, let's get into today's video. Allow me to introduce you to the Godwin family. Earl Godwin had married Geitha, who was of Danish inheritance. And Geisa's brother Alf had married King Canute's sister. And it was through Canute how Godwin and Geisa met. And the, the couple had nine children together, which was Swain, our boy Howard, Tostig, Gerth, Edith, Godgifu, no, Gunhilda, Alfgifu, Leofwine, and Wolfnoth. Now Godwin was made the first Earl of Wessex and he had pretty much worked his way up from virtual obscurity. And this was through um, the reign of King Canute. And his family would soon be a force to be reckoned with. And he was the most powerful Earl in England and he was also an excellent politician and Godwin's father he had led a section of the royal fleet into piracy so he had his lands fortified and he was exiled by King Ethered, Ethered the Unready. Now Godwin's firstborn Swain I think I'm kind of in love with Swain. <laughs> Swain was a bit of a loose cannon and he was rich and he was powerful, but he was also prideful. And Swain had made a claim in front of his own mother that he was in fact the son of King Canute. So he just basically all right called his mother a so after Geitha had recovered from the complete shock of her son's accusation, she actually produced witnesses who were basically going to testify the fact that, um, no, we witnessed your conception. We was there when that happened. So You can use your imagination for that part, as you did. So, with Serene, what do you do with someone like him? Why are you giving more power? Of course. But it was 
it's possibly the fact that he was given more power and responsibility in an effort to make him grow up. So in 1046, Swain was given the earldom of Herefordshire. Now Herefordshire is my domain, as in Herefordshire. And Herefordshire is up against the um, border of Wales. So Sirene's new territory is literally pressing up against the border of Wales. Now Wales was under the control of Grafford Ap Llewellyn. I really hope I pronounced that right. And Grafford was, he was someone who was very much, had started out like Sirene, but he soon changed and he became a powerful warrior and a war maker. So, Grafford had sought to remove um, the English from his territory. And nobles from, forgive my pronunciation, Istrad Tawi, Tiwi, Tiwi, they had attacked Grafford and they had killed 140 of Grafford's household guards. Grafford, he needed a new ally. So instead of seeking inside Wales, he decided to go outside of Wales. And so he turned to his new neighbour, Swain Godwinson. Grafford had suggested that Swain join him in a joint raid on Towie and Daffit as an act of revenge. So Swain naturally leapt at this chance and besides what a better way to demonstrate to his family as the firstborn, as the eldest, that he was ready to lead the family. What could possibly go wrong? Swain had led his men out of Herefordshire across the border to join forces with Grafford. But it never occurred to Swain that he was technically committing treason. Leofric of Mercia was in conflict, was in conflict with Grafford. Now, given Leofric's position as an earl, as an English earl, this meant that England was technically in conflict with Grafford. And there's our boy Swain marching off to war for the purpose of enhancing Grafford's power and territory. Now, the raid, it was pretty much successful, given on which side you was looking on. And Swain had also enhanced his own wealth and by seizing Welsh treasure and slaves. And Swain... On returning home, he was feeling quite proud of himself. You know, you can imagine being a puffed up pigeon. And, and he on his, on his way home, he and his men had passed um, Lempster Abbey in Herefordshire. And there he ordered his men to fetch Abbess at Gifu of Lempster Abbey. So his men did just that. And Swain took Abbas at Gifu back to his home to be his new wife. Now, in fact, they, they didn't actually marry. He had intentions on marrying her, but it didn't happen. It's possible that Swain may have thought. I don't know if Swain actually thought. I don't think he. I don't. I don't think he did much thinking. I think he just acted. Um, it's possible that he thought that this would be a good thing from the family as through marriage he would receive Ed Gifu's enormous estates and lands. But there was only one little problem with Serene's little scenario. The fact that Ed Gifu was an abbess. She was technically a bride of Christ. And what he'd just done was in fact kidnapping an abbess. So, King Edward, Swain's 
brother-in-law was a little bit peeved. So instead of imposing a strict sentence and punishment on um, Swain, so he Edward wouldn't go an all-out war with the Godwins, Edward had demanded for Swain to re return Edgifu back to her abbey. And Swain, he refused. So instead, he decided he was going to keep his nun for a little bit longer. For a whole year. So both the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Worcester, well, they were both livid, you can understand. And they were both putting on as much pressure as possible so um, to get Swain to return at Gifu. There's nothing in the records to actually say what they said or did, but... Swain finally relented and he let Edgifu return back to her abbey. But Swain wasn't happy in having to let go of his nun, so he immediately lashed out um, by seizing lands from the Bishop of Worcester throughout Shropshire. And Swain had probably, he had ridden from place to place, seizing all the lands, and he was with armed company and obviously this wasn't going unnoticed and King Edward and King Edward the Confessor he'd had enough of his troublesome brother-in-law the king exiled Swain Godwinson and he had removed Swain in a way that didn't offend the Godwins so as Swain left England for Flanders to Count Baldwin V, King Edward had divided up Swain's lands between his uh, younger brother, Harold Godwinson, and their cousin, Bjorn Estridson. But there's nothing to say what Swain actually got up to in Flanders, but whatever he done, it couldn't have been good because a year later, he got the boot from Flanders. So Swain went to Denmark. This was in October in 1047. And the exact same month Swain landed in Denmark, King Magnus, who was um, King Edward's enemy, suddenly died. I'm not I'm not saying Swain had anything to do with that. It's probably just a coincidence. The fact that at that time King Magnus was Edward's most dangerous enemy, and he King Magnus was only in his twenties and he just popped it. Now, let me give you a little bit of backstory about King Magnus. Let's go back to Hartha Canute. When Hartha Canute um was protecting Denmark from invasion from Norway. King Magnus was of Norway. And so instead of constantly fighting one another, Hartha Canute said, let's just call it quits. Let's stop. And let's call each other our heirs. So Hartha Canute made King Magnus his heir and King Magnus made Hartha Canute his heir. Hartha Canute died first. So Magnus inherited Denmark. But when Hartha Canute said about being his heir, technically he also said about England. So Magnus now was going, hmm, England's looking quite nice. Yeah. So and that's what made him Edward's enemy. But now he was gone. For now. Well, he's not coming back, obviously, but anyway, let's get on, let's get on with the timeline, okay? <laughs> so King Magnus had died, and no one knew what Swain had got up to in Denmark because it's not recorded, but he also got the boot from Denmark. <sighs> I don't know why. I want to know why. 
So Swain headed back to England and he had a fleet of seven ships. Now, I'm not quite sure how again, but he had actually managed to get the king's protection and Edward was going, oh yeah, have all your lands back. Just have everything back. Yeah, go for it, you know. But his brother, Howard Godwinson, who he was peeved, basically. His older brother, he, he was an embarrassment on the family. And Howard, who was a much more sensible noble, he and his cousin Bjorn had brought this to the king's attention. And they basically said to him, don't do it. You'd be making a huge mistake if you give Swain his lands and his power back. He's already done it once. What makes you think he's not going to do anything like this again? So Edward actually listened to Howard and Bjorn. And Edward basically told Swain to gather up his stuff. You've got to go. But Swain's luck proved to be on his side. Just as Edward gave Swain the heave-ho to get his butt out of England, disaster struck. A combined fleet of Welsh and Irish um, ships had started to make their way up the River Severn. This was bad. Edward needed his highest ranking nobles to handle the situation. He even put Swain in the group. But he made Swain promise that he would leave within four days. Otherwise he would be executed. Harold Godwinson and his younger brother Tostig took control of two of the king's personal ships. His father, Godwin, took control of the rest of the fleet's 42 vessels. The entire court was involved. Harold was suddenly removed of the king's ship, but we're not told why. It's possible that someone realised, got oh crap, there's no one watching Swain. So Howard was, you know, basically to watch, you know, watch your brother. So this left Godwin, Tostig and Bjorn and 44 ships heading west, ready to crush the joint Irish and Welsh invasion. But they were immediately overtaken by bad weather, the weather was so bad that the entire fleet were forced to shelter at Pevensey and this meant that their invaders could continue on their course. Swain had also headed for Pevensey. So after two days he arrived at their camp and Howard, who had been held back, we still don't know why, and the only person at that camp who had openly opposed to Swain's return to court was his cousin Bjorn. So Swain requested a meeting with his father Godwin and Godwin agreed, but he brought Bjorn with him. So Swain, um, Swain knew that Edward was at Sandwich, only a day's ride away. So Swain had begged both his father and his cousin to support him to have him reinstated by the king. Eventually, Bjorn agreed to ride with him. Now, historians, they argue that Bjorn may have felt remorse for Swain, but come on, exile, that's a big deal. So it's more likely it was political. It was possible that he was following orders, Godwin's orders. 
So Bjorn and Swain left with three of Bjorn's men along with Swain's um, men. So as they were going along, Swain had ordered his men to halt and they were actually going to need to make a detour to Swain's ships who were still stationed at Bosham and he really needed to get back to them you know but Bjorn come on he wasn't an idiot he knew what Swain was like and Bjorn refused to make this detour but Swain had pleaded with his cousin stating that his crew could sail off at any minute without him. And besides, the king's told me to get the hell out of here in four days and I really need my ships. So Bjorn had agreed to ride with him to Bosham. And it must have been quite the relief for Bjorn to still see those ships there. So... They arrived, they saw the ships, and it's like, right, let's get back on track. Let's get back to our original plan. Meeting with Edward, but once they got there, Swain had an idea. Why not go aboard the ships? You know, it'd be a lot quicker to get to Edward by, by sea than it would be by horse. But Bjorn's instincts were beginning to scream at him. Something felt really wrong, so Bjorn refused. But Serene wasn't ready to take no for an answer. So Bjorn, badly outnumbered, he only had three men. He was quickly captured and he was tied up. And he was then bundled onto a boat. They rode out to Serene's fleet and they headed west away from Godwin and away from King Edward. Instead, they was heading towards Exmouth. Now, at some point on the voyage, Bjorn was murdered and he was buried in a church. But that's the part that doesn't make any sense. Why kill a high member of court, a, a noble, an earl, and a member of your own family and especially just when you're hoping to get your lands restored was it was it simply just it was it just revenge was it Swain wanting revenge on his cousin but why take that time to go back to shore to bury him at a church it was just a simple thing like revenge. Why not just kill him there and then and sting him overboard? But it's all guesswork and there isn't any accounts from Swain himself. But was Bjorn a hostage? And where did Swain go after he went? He went straight back to Flanders. Had he made a deal with Count Baldwin? After all, not all of Bjorn, not only was Bjorn an Earl of the East Midlands, he was also the brother of the King of Denmark, Swain Estridsen. Yeah, another Swain, I <laughs> know. So it's very possible that there wasn't a plan. It was just Swain Godwinson being Swain Godwinson. We just don't know. Whichever way it was, Denmark's rival Count Baldwin had offered Swain's protection. And King Edward had now declared Swain a nothing, a man of no honour. There was, and this was much worse than being exiled. The king had declared Swain as a non-person. 
which basically meant that no laws applied to anything that happened to Swain in England. The king was telling everyone that could get to Swain they could do whatever they wanted to him without any punishment. But Swain wasn't in England, he was in Flanders and it was told that Swain had actually lost a lot of men. Um, not told quite why, but it's quite possible that he lost those men through murdering his cousin Bjorn. And through all of this, that combined um, fleet of the Welsh and Irish, we're not told what happened to it. We don't know whether they, whether the issue was, was resolved, whether they actually got there, whether there was a battle, whether the English and Irish invasion, they got what they wanted. We don't know. There's no record of it. Was it, was Swain doing all of it and it just happened to go, oh crap, Swain's doing something again. What do we write about? Which one do we write about? There's just nothing. After 1049, the house of Godwin was not looking so good. But Godwin was still trying to, with He is still trying to bring back his eldest son, which was no doubt making things worse. That, but it makes you wonder how someone like Swain Godwinson actually happened. But then when you learn that his parents had been cleaning up after Swain's mess for his entire life, It's possible that Godwin, he could have had blinkers on, you know, he could have, he just couldn't see what his son was like. He, he just had that unconditional love for his children that he just couldn't see what Swain was doing. And he was willing to destroy his own dynasty for whatever Swain was doing and Swain was sinking and he was taking Godwin and the family with him. But what about Edith and Howard? They was witnessing all of this. Edith was married to King Edward and Howard, who appeared to be the sensible brother, he was slowly watching their lives crumble. They're falling apart all thanks to Swain and their father was constantly picking up the pieces that Swain left behind. King Edward had given um, Bjorn's earldom to his own nephew, Ralph, instead of it giving it to the Godwins. Ralph was the son of his sister, Godgifu who was married to Count Eustace II of Bologna. Eustace was Godgifu's second husband and was Ralph's stepfather. So Ralph was someone that Swain Godwinson had personally hated. Swain was feuding with Ralph, so naturally, Edward gave Swain's lands to his enemy. <laughs> you can't help but laugh at this. <sighs> but not only was Ralph Swain's enemy, he also gave those lands to the son of the French noble who was also a close ally to Duke William of Normandy. Howard Godwinson was aware that Edward wasn't just mad with Swain, he was peeved at the whole family. So Howard went out and he did 
the smart thing. He gathered a few of his men and he headed to Dartmouth to find the grave of Bjorn Estridsson. Eventually, Howard found his cousin's body, but considering that it was in an unmarked grave, it could have been anyone Howard had dug up, but regardless, the body was taken back to Winchester and the body was taken to the Old Minster, the resting place of the Anglo-Saxon kings. Well, the kings of Wessex. And Howard had the body laid to rest next to Bjorn's uncle, King Canute. And it, it, it was a really kind gesture what Howard had done. And it appears that Howard's efforts had worked. Howard actually managed to maintain a good relationship with King Edward. And it's possible that Edward may have sympathised with Howard, I mean, let's face it, his, Edward's family wasn't perfect. Meanwhile, Godwin, he was still trying to get Swain back to England. So Godwin had reached out to an old friend, Bishop Aldred of Worcester. And Godwin had actually played a part in getting um, Aldred being elected as Bishop of Worcester back in 1046. So Godwin had wanted the bishop's support in getting the king to get Swain back to England. And Bishop, the Bishop of Worcester had actually wanted something in return. He wanted to extend his bishopric to Exeter but in order to do this not only did he need the king's permission to actually go to Rome to seek the Pope's permission so Edward gave him permission so off he went to Rome and he got the permission he needed and on his way back home from Rome he took a little teeny tiny detour and he picked up Swain Godwinson. Godwin had got his son back. And now it appears that after eight years, King Edward was actually beginning to challenge his chief counsellor. In October 1050, Edson Archbishop of Canterbury had died and this was the man who had crowned Edward and Godwin just knew he knew the man for the job this was a man named Ethelrich and he was a monk of Christchurch and he was also family and Canterbury well that's Godwin's territory and it was also clear, maybe not to Godwin, but to others it was, that his power was beginning to wane at court ever since Swain had joined Rouse in a war and kidnapped a nun. The monks of Christchurch had held an election, which wasn't normally done back then, so if Etheridge was elected, it meant that Godwin would have had a whole load of holy men behind him. But Edward, this meant Edward, Edward, Edward would have had to accept um, the nomination. And the Godwins were everywhere. Everywhere you looked in England, there was a Godwin. And having a relative of Godwin as an Archbishop of Canterbury, that was just a little bit too much for Edward. So Edward refused this request and instead Edward appointed Robert of Chumiege, 
a man who had been with Edward from the start. He came with him from Normandy and Edward had only made Robert of Chumiege the Bishop of London two years before. And Robert was Edward's closest advisor and Robert was one of Godwin's biggest political rivals. The king began building a new counter fraction of Norman aristocrats and clergymen who would be loyal to him. And Robert was at the centre, placing Robert as Archbishop of Canterbury was a big slap in the face for Earl Godwin. It turned out that it wasn't just Swain who was causing a few headaches. In 1051, his younger brother Tostig had married Judith, the daughter of Count Baldwin of Flanders, the one who Swain went to. And Flanders was feuding with Eustace the second. So he now was also moved at the Godwins, not just Edward. And but it wasn't recorded now, Eustace was actually in England visiting Edward, but we're not told why. We're only told, it's only recorded, Eustace the second visited Edward for a chat. And that's it. That's all we're told. So we don't know what he actually wanted to say to Edward. So after he'd seen Edward and had his chat, Eustace had a meal in Canterbury and then he and his men thought, oh, maybe we should head on home, you know, a bit late now, let's go home. But as they were a mile away from Dover, Eustace and his men had stopped and they thought, actually, you know what, I think we better, probably better just to find a place to stay for the night and we can start afresh in the morning, you know, be better. So Eustace and his men, they put on their armour. Yeah, I always put my armour on before I go to bed for the night, you know, as you do. But once they were fully armed, they continued on their way to Dover. And once there, one of Eustace's men came across a house that he liked the look of. And he decided he wanted to stay there. Now, the owner of the house and naturally going, uh, no, it's my house. You know, this is my family home. So Eustace's man he withdrew his weapon and he attacked the own the homeowner but it turned out the homeowner knew how to fight and even though he was wounded it was Eustace's man who was killed Eustace on hearing the noise had got on his horse and he rode up to the house and along with the rest of his men, the homeowner was outside, victorious. He had just protected his house. He protected his family from an intruder. And Eustace killed him there on the spot. Eustace then unleashed his entire group of men onto the town. They moved from home to home, killing the people in the streets, killing them in their own homes. And once the people in Dover had actually realised what the hell was going on, they defended themselves. The English were required to know how to fight. So they quickly organised themselves and they fought Eustace and his men and what followed was a bloodbath. Over 20 townsfolk, Dover townsfolk, and 19 of Eustace's soldiers were killed with many more injured. 
And you know what Eustace went and done? They fled. They fled town as fast as they can get out of there. And you would have thought they'd go back. No, they went to Edward. So they went straight back to Edward after committing an act of war on Edward's own English soil. They went back to it, back and back to Edward. And it wasn't possibly only did it on Edward's soil, it was Godwin's territory. Dover is Godwin's land. Eustace went to Dover knowing exactly what he was going to do. But what Eustace hadn't accounted on was the fact that they knew how to fight back. So was this done without the king's approval? Eustace had told Edward that the men of Dover had attacked him and his men. They were the innocent ones. On hearing this, Edward then turned to Godwin and he demanded that Earl Godwin was to gather his men and to ravage the people of Dover. The same people that Godwin was honoured and duty bound to protect. The only crime that they had committed was trying to protect themselves from Eustace's brutal army. It looked like an, it, it was intentional. That raid was intentional on Godwin's land. And when it went bad, the king demanded that Godwin finish Eustace's job. But what, what Edward was commanding of Godwin was beyond what Edward was asking. Edward was instead abandoning his duty to his people and he was choosing to satisfy his own desire to hurt his chief counsellor. The same chief counsellor who had played the pivotal role in getting Edward on the throne, that there's some records that state that it was Godwin's argument at the right time that had won over the Witan at that crucial moment, and it was the Witan that had sent Godwin over to Normandy to bring Edward to England to be crowned. Godwin, for all of his faults, he was well regarded as an honourable and duty bound man. It was these qualities that had made him popular with King Canute and he remained popular enough that he was able to keep and expand his power throughout the reigns of the three following kings. Godwin, he was intelligent, he was courageous, eloquent and kind to his equals and gentle to the common folk. He was a man who believed in enacting justice and protecting the rights of people. When it came to English honour culture, you couldn't get any better than Godwin. And now his king, his king, was demanding that he would go and kill his own people? What was Godwin supposed to do? Godwin was duty and honour bound to obey his king, but he was also duty and honour bound to protect his people. Godwin could lose everything, whichever way he chose. Only 10 years earlier, Edward's predecessor, Hartha Canute, had ordered his earls to raid and slaughter the people of Worcester. And Florence of Worcester says that the earls which had included Godwin had carried out the order of the massacre of 1041. It would have been much, much worse if the local bishop hadn't have given the people enough warning. Many were able to escape 
but there were still people in Worcester who got cut down by their own nobility on the order of their own king. Even though Edward's order was vicious and shocking and against honour culture, bear in mind, you think of the time it was, that was England was in full honour culture. Honour culture had failed to stop this happening in the past. Worcester was proof that even the nobles who were known for their honour and duty bound would obey authority over honour when it came to it. Besides Worcester, Worcester was different to Dover. Worcester happened when people attacked the king's officers. Dover had been defending themselves and Worcester was in Mercia, Earl Leofrix. And he had agreed to King Arthur Canute's demands. This was a whole new situation for Godwin. He was duty bound to the people of Dover. He wasn't duty bound to Worcester. And King Edward, he wasn't Hartha Canute. Edward was weak and unpopular. Granted, Hartha Canute was extremely unpopular, but he certainly wasn't weak. And every day, Edward was proven to be more and more like his father. Godwin had now commanded most of the forces in the south. Dover wasn't Worcester, not for Godwin. So Godwin refused the king's demands. King Edward didn't take it well. The king ordered for his council to gather with him at Gloucester and they were there to decide what to do with Earl Godwin. And Edward, he chose Gloucester deliberately. It was sending out a message. Gloucester was in West Saxon territory, Godwin's territory. Godwin's family had an estate only a few miles away. The council was going to meet and decide Godwin's fate on Godwin's own lands. It was recorded that both Earl Leofric and Earl Mercia and Earl Seward, Earl of Northumbria, had mobilised part of their military resources and they made it to Gloucester. And it was also added that Robert of Chumiege had alleged that Earl Godwin had despoiled Canterbury and other estates and that Godwin was responsible for killing King Edward's brother Alfred. And now that Godwin was planning to kill the king. These were serious allegations, although probably not true. Godwin, accompanied with his sons, had attempted to reach the king to resolve the conflict that was threatening the stability of the kingdom, but they were turned away. Count Eustace decided to join in with Robert de Chumiege, saying that Godwin was a traitor and he intended to kill the king. And with that, the Godwins were banned from meeting with, with Edward, Eustace and his men. They then marched on Swain Godwinson's territory of Hereford. They built a fort and using that fort, they ravaged the city. Well, it was a town then, it's a city now, but Edward, he just did this purely to get a response from the Godwins. And the Godwins gave him a response. This is where you cue that dramatic film music coming up. Earl Godwin sent messages to his thanes throughout Wessex and ordered everyone to gather their forces to join him at Langtry, which was the border of Wessex and Cornwall. Howard Godwinson did the same. He gathered his forces from East Anglia, bringing them to Langtry. Swain Godwinson doing his job for once 
actually gathered his forces from Herefordshire, meeting his father and his brothers at Langdry. The Anglo-Saxon chronicles stated that the Godwin's army was beyond count. They were coming to Edward head on. If Edward wanted to fight, they was going to give him one. Once they were all there at Langtree, Earl Godwin and his sons sent a message to the king. They said that the king must arrest Count Eustace and all of his men, including that henchman they've got at Hereford, and hand them over to Earl Godwin to meet English justice. God, I love this man. He added that if the king fell to do so, then Earl Godwin and all of his forces were prepared to meet them in battle. Godwin, Earl Howard and Earl Swain moved their army to Beverstone, which was 15 miles south of Gloucester. They were only 15 miles away from Edward. Now, this was bad for Edward. Now, when Edward had summoned Earl Leofric and Earl Seward, they only brought a few men with them, nowhere near enough to take on the Godwin's army. Now, things they were just beginning to dawn on the king's earls on how bad this situation had actually got. So they got to work summoning their own men. So the full army of Mercia and Northumbria were called to protect the king. Even Ralph, the new Earl of Eastern Midlands, had summoned his full army, marching them to Gloucester. But Godwin didn't want a civil war. He spent his whole life trying to put trying to hold the kingdom together. He may have assumed that Edward felt the same way, but England wasn't Edward's home. He had spent more time in Normandy than he had in England. And the fact was Count Eustace was more valuable to Edward than Godwin was. Godwin had realized that most of the nobles in England were in each side of the army. The best warriors were there and neither side had a clear advantage. If fighting started, not only would it be brutal, but it could last for days. According to the chronicles, both King Edward and Eustace were ready to fight in a civil war in England Eustace pretty much had a head start with Dover and Hereford and Robert of Chumier, <laughs> the Archbishop of Canterbury was doing all he could to put fuel on the fire, never mind the fact that a large amount of English nobility would be killed in that fighting. But those, those empty slots Edward could easily fill with his Normandy advisers, those that he trusted. This was beginning to dawn on the English earls and they urged the king to avoid war, warning him that open battle with the Godwins was risky and even if, if victory happened, would leave England open to other civil wars and invasion. Edward had to listen to his council. The council had decided that there would be a second Witan at London, and this Witan would be held in two weeks time on the 21st of September in 1051. There, Godwin and his sons would have the opportunity to defend themselves and the council would determine their fate from there. The council had also suggested an exchange of hostages and the Godwins had agreed to that demand and that Earl Godwin handed over his youngest son Wolfnoth 
and his grandson Hakon. Hakon was Swain Godwin's son. They handed them over to the king as a sign of their good intentions. Now, if Godwin was waiting for the other side to produce hostages, then he would have been waiting a very long time. There was no record of Godwin ever receiving any hostages. All Godwin got in return was reassurance that the king wouldn't kill him and his entire family, at least not today. Once the hostages were handed over, the king made one more demand. Swain Godwinson was exiled for life. Swain would forever be an outlaw and it was at this moment that Godwin realised he made a terrible mistake. Edward and his nobles turned and they went back to London and he had commanded the nobles from the Midlands and the North to meet him there for a meeting about Godwin. Godwin also decided he was going to head to London. He was he was doing everything he could to avoid an all out civil war. But Godwin wasn't an idiot. He was with he went with company. He brought his sons, he brought his loyal thanes and his army. But two weeks was a long time and Edward knew that as time passed and more nobles answered to the king's call, Godwin's army would begin to lose morale. And sure enough, within a few days, Godwin's army began to dwindle. Edward had summoned Godwin. He was ordered to present himself towards the council and stand trial for his crimes. We don't know what charges Godwin and his sons had faced, but whatever they were facing, it had must have been significant. Godwin must have realised how much danger he was in. So Godwin sent his own messenger um, asking Edward for a safe passage into the city and to provide hostages to seal the deal. Edward's response was to command Godwin to hand over all of his things. Godwin agreed and he surrendered his men to Edward. And when the Thanes crossed the Thames to join the king's forces, King Edward provided Godwin with nothing. Edward instead Gave, Ed, gave Godwin another command. Godwin and his sons were to enter London and stand trial. He also said that if Godwin was worried for their safety, they could bring 12 men with them. 12 men isn't going to help much if the king decided he was going to execute Godwin and his sons there and there. Godwin was prepared for there to be assassins waiting for him on the other side of the Thames and the court would be hostile towards him. Edward was now being described by his own scribes that he was a king without mercy. Godwin sent his messenger back to the king ensuring Edward that if that his one desire was to prove his innocence at trial and he was ready to do it. All he wanted was a promise of safety and you would think that with Godwin proclaim his, complete, proclaiming his innocence right from the very beginning, handing over hostages and his thanes that he had least deserved the passage of safety into court. That's what a reasonable person would think, but Edward wasn't a reasonable person. Instead, he sent his messenger back to Edward. This time his messenger was in tears. There would be no hostages, but the king would make peace 
with the Godwins and pardon all of them once Godwin had brought his brother Alfred back to life. All of Godwin's fears came true. There was no chance of a fair trial. There was only one choice. Run. And that's exactly what they did. Godwin leapt, leapt on his horse and he and fled and with him was his wife Gaither, his sons Howard, Swain, Tostig and Leofrine and the retainers who had remained with him. Robert of Schumierge also fled. He knew that if Godwin escaped and had rallied all his allies, it would be Robert of Schumierge's head. So off they went given chase to Godwin. But the Godwins had a head start and they knew that land way better than Robert at Chubiège. So as hard as he tried, the Archbishop couldn't catch them up. Howard and Leofrine headed to Bristol, taking advantage of a ship that Swain had prepared, ready for a quick getaway. Who else? But Sir Wayne Godwinson would have had made preparations like this. Howard and Leofrine boarded the ship and they sailed to Ireland. The rest of the family headed for their family estate at Bosham and then managed to board a ship to Thorny Island in West Sussex. The Godwins had escaped Edward's grasp with their lives. The next morning, King Edward declared the Godwins as outlaws. He sent Bishop Aldred in pursuit of Howard, Howard and Leofrine. He then seized their lands and their titles, quite probably given them to Edward's French allies, including the Archbishop Robert. But what Edward needed to do was to ensure that the Godwins could never get their power back. And that was what Robert of Chumierge was focused on. He pushed Edward into divorcing Queen Edith. They all had to go. But this was something Edward just couldn't do. Granted, he he stripped her of all of her lands and her properties, but he didn't divorce her. Instead, he placed her in a nunnery, and it was recorded that when she arrived at Wilton Abbey, it was without any honours, and she only had one servant. There was a report of a a monk who had just been elected as Bishop of London. His name translated meant Sparrowhawk, but in Old English, it meant Spear Havoc. Now Spear Havoc had been in line with Godwin, but once Godwin was out, Spear Havoc was also ousted from his new post by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Robert of Chumierge. He was also expelled from London and Spear Havoc, he wasn't daft. He had already seen what had happened to Godwin, so Spear Havoc had already fled. He, he went abroad, he gone, but he didn't leave empty handed. Instead, he took the treasure of London with him, bags of it, which included all the gems that were set aside for King Edward's crown. How's that? Edward continued to rampage all of Godwin's loyalists with their wealth being seized and Edward would soon get messengers Arriving at court, one messenger came from Count Baldwin V of Flanders and another from King Henry I of France. 
two of the most powerful nobles in Europe were writing to Edward and they were doing it because they both wanted to intercede on Godwin's behalf. They told the king that Godwin had simply wanted a lawful trial, trial, and asked Edward to make peace with Godwin and grant him mercy. And it was recorded that they wrote in vain. Edward had basically told them to go and do one as he was king of England, not Baldwin, not Henry, and certainly not Godwin. There were some sources that claimed that Duke William of Normandy just happened to arrive in England with a large army. He met with Edward. But why would William make that trip? Granted, Emma of Normandy, who was William's great aunt, and she was seriously ill at this point. But why bring a whole army? If you're going to see your dying aunt, wouldn't you just bring yourself and a couple of people with you? It's strange that William and a whole French army would decide to turn up just when England almost erupted into civil war. A war that was only avoided because Godwin refused to fight the king, even when he was antagonised. William arrived in England with his army, with no war. Are we, are we really meant to buy that? Come on, really? It's, po it's possible that William had heard that Edward and Godwin were at loggerheads and there was quite the falling out and he may have, oh, I'm going to just go lend my cousin a hand, you know, just give him a help. It may have been that, but it just happened, he happened to arrive just as it died down. But then there's Count Eustace. Eustace wasn't just Edward's brother-in-law. He was also an ally to Duke William of Normandy. In fact, Eustace was so close to Duke William that Eustace joined William in a famous battle. Yeah, that battle. Wasn't it Eustace that started that fight with Godwin? It was Eustace who was pushing for war between Godwin and Edward. But despite all of this, Godwin did something that no one expected, especially Eustace. Godwin chose exile instead of an all-out war. Then suddenly, Duke William of Normandy just happens to turn up with a big ass army? <sighs> Come on, do you honestly think we're that stupid? Godwin was proven to be the better man. And that's where I'm going to leave it. You're going to have to stay tuned for the next video. Oh, I hope you enjoyed that video. It's quite a long one. I really hope you made it all the way to the end. Congrats if you did, because it's quite the long video. But let me know what you think down below. I am oh, I love the Godwin family. I know they were portrayed a little bit portrayed in, is it Vikings for Harla? I've only just started watching it, so I'm only just starting. But, oh, I wish someone would make a full on series just about the Godwins. Just that. Oh, I'd love it. Love it, love it, love it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And, oh, I really hope you enjoyed the video. And stay tuned for the next one. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I will see you all new. See you all soon for the next one. I need a drink. <laughs> see you all soon. Take care. Bye.